feeling feeling mighty fine
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I learned by the stupid things. That's what I said. I did too. I said there was stupid things happen. But when I had my first year, we were doing the. Uh,
I heard that. I heard that. What I didn't hear, God did. Amen. Yeah, technology. Technology. Um, good to be with you this morning. Glad to be in God's house with God's people. Smiling and happy and ready to hear the Word of God. I'm ready to hear the Word of God too. I don't know what God's got in mind today. But anyway, uh, we're going to go to prayer here in a little bit. A um, couple things that uh, are on my mind. Number one, my mother is having surgery in the morning. Um, it's at 6.30. Um, so pray for her. Well, she's got to be there at 6.30. And uh, so just lift her up if you would and pray that it's a successful surgery um, and that her pain is down to a minimum. Last time she had this, she had to stay in the hospital about five days, I think she said. Wasn't that right? Something like that. So she's hoping now maybe just one or two days. So just uh, lift her up if you would. Uh, let's see, who, who else is sick this morning? Yeah, Sterling and Gloria, pray for them and, and uh, lift them up if you would. Monica, pray for our son Caleb and uh, pray for his salvation. God, have mercy on him. Who else has got a prayer request this morning? Sister Betty. Uh, pray for my daughter and son-in-law. They were in a, they went back last weekend to Michigan and they were in an accident. Oh, no. Pray for All right, we will. Yes, Emily. David's having a rough day today. Sure thing. We will pray for David. Yes, Mama Michael. I sure will pray for her. She got a chest cold. Somebody else. Yes, Derek. Make a great friend Charlie. That is believe that's the grinder blade of the soul. She cracked away and well. She didn't write the knuckles, so it's close to the bone. So pray that it heals up. All right. Anybody else? Got a prayer request? Yes, Sister Lynn. I've got three dear friends that uh, lost loved ones this past week. Yes. And, uh, it's hard. Pray that uh, they all knew the Lord, and if they didn't, maybe their family would come to know the Lord before it's too late. Amen? We were talking in Sunday school this morning about God's wrath. And um, when God pours out his wrath on this earth in, Re in the book of Revelation, uh, it's things that are on this earth are going to be over and done with. But when God inflicts his wrath upon a lost soul, that soul spends eternity dealing with God's wrath. And I mentioned this morning, picture in your mind somebody that is trapped in a car and the car is on fire nobody uh, from rescue can get to the car you can't or that person can't get out of the car and they are burning alive inside that car and they are screaming top of their lungs that from the pain from the torture from the fear that inflicts them hell is much worse than that. And while that kind of affliction and that kind of wrath may end shortly on this earth relative to hell, hell is forever. And that's something to think about every now and then when I told everybody it's, it's, it's okay to get sober about hell and to re remind yourself of where people go who do not live for the Lord. And um, so pray for, pray for your loved ones. Pray for people you know that are lost. Hell is forever. Once they're there, there's no getting back. So pray for your lost loved ones. Pray for people you know. Maybe do a check on yourself. Make sure you're right with God. Amen? 
Somebody else got a prayer request this morning. How you doing, Lawson? What you got on your mind, buddy? Pray for my TV work. Nah. <laughs> nah. Pray that mine works. What does that say? Ah! Ah, ah, ah! Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. I think we're ready. I don't want to see Lady Bird. What is it? Well, it ain't working. Now I'm angry. I'm about to inflict my wrath on this television. See? Good. That's what I meant. No movies. I just didn't want anything to pop up there in the house of God. I don't trust Disney. Amen? Don't trust Disney. Anybody else got a prayer request this morning? Yes, Rose? Okay, are you sitting, Joanne? All right. Anybody else? Yes, Noah? Pray for his foot. We will, buddy. We certainly will. Okay. With your heart doctor. Got it. Who needs prayer this morning? All right, let's bow our heads, let's go to the Lord in prayer, all right? Tell God thank you on the things He's blessed you with. Tell God thank you for forgiving you of your sins. If you have not confessed your sins, now is the time to do it. Our Father, we come before you this morning, God, and we do thank you very, very much for allowing us to come into your house, for the blessing, dear God, of, of meeting and greeting everybody here. Lord, we're seeing people, Lord, that love each other, are getting to know each other better. Lord, the fellowship is sweet. To see the children, Lord, uh, in this place is a blessing. And Father, we just thank you very, very much for all that you've done for us. And Father, I thank you for meeting the needs of each and every person here. And God, that you always hear their prayer. And while your answer may not come Right away, we trust and believe that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So, Father, teach us, Lord, that when we pray, teach us to wait, teach us to have patience. Teach us, Father, to not stop praying, but to pray and pray and pray until, God, you're ready to answer. And Father, we ask, dear God, that you would bless all of those, Lord, who are sick this morning, could not be with us. We thank you, God, Lord, that we could provide our church service for them to watch wherever they are. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just bless that. Bless all those, Lord, that are watching online. And, Father, for these families that Sister Lynn mentioned, all three of them that have lost loved ones to death. And Father, we don't know where they stand with you, but, Father, we pray, dear God, that maybe their family, maybe their friends, maybe their loved ones, would, uh, Lord, they would sober up and they would wake up and they would understand that death is real and death comes to every one of us and nobody's going to escape it. And when it comes to your wrath, no one escapes your judgment. But Father, you have provided a way through Jesus Christ to satisfy the just demands uh, that your justice requires and that Christ paid the way providing the way for us, Lord, to be forgiven, to have mercy extended to us, and Lord, to be free from the wrath of sin. And Father, we thank you for that. We ask your blessings, Lord, upon each and every one that's here. Lord, we had hands raised all over the building. I pray, dear God, Lord, that as each one calls upon you, Lord, that you would answer them. Uh, Lord, out of your love, out of your grace, out of your mercy, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would hear us when we sing. Help us, Father, to lift our voices and our hearts and our spirits to you. Father, hear us when we pray this morning. 
And Lord, just I pray, dear God, that you would give us answers to the things that we've called upon you for. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless the preaching of your word. Lord, open up uh, my mind and my heart uh, to the direction the message should go in. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless your word. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for this being a special Sunday, Lord, right here before Easter. And the people that we're going to baptize and the people that we have baptized in the recent past. Lord, we just thank you for it, and I pray, dear God, that you bless each one, Lord, that is coming to stand before you and before this, these witnesses and testify through baptism that they are ready to walk according to your ways and according to your will. They're walking in a newness of life, Lord, that, that the world and the devil just can't take away from them. So, Lord, just bless this service and bless everything that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen, Amen. Now, let me try to get this on because I got something really, really neat to show you. And I'm hoping this thing will work. Aha! Well, we got that to work. Trust me on this one. I got something really, really neat to show you. It's about somebody here this morning. Any day now. While that's doing that, uh, let me give you a couple of announcements that are going on. Uh, let's see here. Saturday, March 26th. That's this coming Saturday. No? Oh. Okay. Yeah, it is a misprint. 26th is Monday. Okay. Never mind then. All right. Ah. I don't care. Oh, got it. Got it. Come on. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. We have... What does it say? Sitting here amongst us is somebody famous, worldwide famous. Brother George caught just on a pool out the Mississippi River, right? A 97-pound carp. Now, he called the uh, conservation department. They said that the Missouri record was 80 pounds and that he broke the Missouri record. The conservation agent did some checking, called him later and said, not only did you break the Missouri record, you broke the world record. Isn't that like God with a sense of humor to catch the biggest fish in the world and it's all unedible, you can't eat it. But Brother George did say, He's going to eat it a different way. He's going to grind that thing up, spread it all over his garden, and let his tomatoes and his everything else eat off of it. And he'll eat it this summer. Amen? Amen. I tell you what, that's a big... And, and those of you who know Brother George, you know, couldn't happen to a better fisherman. Amen. Brother George, we're proud of you. God bless you. We're glad to know you. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Amen. All right, uh, just one more thing. A lot of us are going to go down uh, on April the 8th, which would be a Monday, down to uh, somewhere around, I figure, Cape Girardeau or uh, maybe, um, oh, what was I thinking of? Perryville? Somewhere around in there. Huh? I can sit alongside the highway. 
because uh, it's going to be a wide stretch, but uh, this is like our second total eclipse uh, in just, well, since 2017 was the last one. And uh, now we're having one again, and they're saying that there's something special about this one. I, I haven't read the articles yet, but looking forward to that. I love anything that has to do with the heavens and stars and everything like that, because God ordained it. God's going to have the, the moon and the motion of the sun and the earth to intersect all in the same place at the same time and just block out the sun. People years ago used to freak out that that was some kind of sign from God or whatever. And, and I don't know, maybe it is. But we know the God that is directing the course and the path. Now listen, if the moon and the sun and the stars will obey God's voice and God's commands, what does that say about us? Amen? Let's obey God and do what He says. Somebody say amen. Let's sing some more songs this morning. Singing's good already. There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not I am with thee, peace be still In all of my heaven throne Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing I know, feasting on the riches of His grace, resting in the sheltering wing, always looking on His smiling face, that is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Last song this morning. I'm trying to move things along this morning because we've got a lot to do. Uh, that'd be D. Up Calvary's mountain, what dreadful morn! Walk Christ my Savior. Oh uh -huh. 
about what Jesus did for you this morning, I know in life we all suffer. We all deal with things that we don't want to deal with. Hurt in ways that in some cases are almost unimaginable. And uh, I had a lady ask me years ago, she uh, suffered as a child, and she asked me, how could God allow someone who was innocent to go through something like that? And I was young then, I didn't really know an answer, but God helped me. And I, I immediately thought of this, and I said, Jesus didn't do anything wrong either. He went to the cross, carried our transgressions, he suffered, uh, was beaten and scourged, uh, hanging on the cross for hours, suffocating to death slowly, and he did all of that for my benefit so that I could be free from sin amen and you never know but what God may have you suffering for someone else's benefit you never know uh, this morning I'm gonna preach a message uh, I'm gonna try to make it quick watch out for those words but I'm going to try to make it quick, but I'm going to preach a message directed in, in that direction uh, about being a help to people who need help. And I want you to think about that and pray about it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. Lord, you've provided our table. You've provided our roof. You've provided our clothing. And Lord, all the things that pertain to life and sustenance, Lord, you've provided all of that. That God also, you provided your only begotten Son as a substitutionary sacrifice. Instead of us having to die on the cross, it was Christ. And it could only be Christ. And we thank you, God, that your only begotten Son suffered for our benefit. And so, Father, if, if we are due to suffer on this earth... For the sake of others who need it. For the sake of others who need help. Who need salvation. Father if you would. Remove the scourge from them. And place it on us. Lord that's the epitome of what love is all about. Doing for others. What they cannot do for themselves. And suffering for others. And sacrificing for others. So Father teach us Lord. How to be patient in suffering. How to love people enough. To want to give of ourselves in that way. Use us, Father, in such a way for your glory and for the benefit and the salvation of others. Bless this offering, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I need that. Uh, you see it up there on the screen? Turn your Bible to Exodus 17, if you would. Exodus 17. It's good to see everybody here this morning. And uh, we are glad that you decided to come to the house of the Lord this morning. All of you here and all of you watching online. We are glad to have you. And hope that we can be a blessing to you. Somebody uh, 
thanked me this morning um, for the messages, I guess, that I've been preaching on, on this issue of Egypt and the promised land and Israel going from Egypt to the promised land and the things that occurred to them and happened to them on their way, things that were designed to stop them from going into Canaan land. And uh, they said it made a big difference in a situation that they're going through. And I was uh, just humbly thankful to be able to do that. I want to be a blessing instead of a curse. I can very easily be a curse. I am human. I make mistakes. I don't like making mistakes. Usually the mistakes that I make hurt people. And if you knew me, I don't like hurting people. It's just not, not who I am. But I have the ability to do it. And uh, when I do, it just really, really bothers me. And I have to ask the Lord over and over and over for God to forgive me, for God to heal the situation. I offended someone years ago in something that I said to them. I was trying to be funny. And um, they didn't think it was funny at all. And when I look back on it, I'm going, Hogger, you idiot. Why did you say that? And I prayed all day long in tears that this person would forgive me. And finally, late in the evening, uh, they resp I've been try was trying to get a hold of them all day. And finally, late in the evening, they responded back and they said, I, I forgive you. And uh, it was just another occasion where I had to be careful with what comes out of my mouth. So I like to be a help to people. I like to be a blessing, not a burden. And um, that's just something that God has put in me. And it's actually required for us who name the name of the Lord. We call on the name of the Lord. We ask God to bless our lives. We ask God to do things for us. We ask God to heal us and to help us and use us for His glory. Um, but sometimes when people need help, uh, we tend to turn our backs on them. Uh, we tend to uh, try to ignore it and hope that it goes away and hope that we don't have to do anything for somebody. Uh, some people are just like that. I don't understand that, but some people are. Maybe I am to some extent like that. I probably am. So this morning... <clears throat> We're going to hopefully uh, learn a lesson. I'm not comfortable with this message. I believe it's what God wants me to preach this morning, but I'm not comfortable with it. So I'm going to try to let as much of God's Word speak for me that I can. And then uh, we'll worship the Lord this morning with some baptisms. Turn, uh, Exodus chapter 17. Let me give you the gist of... Of what's going on here. Uh, if we look to, let's see here. Verse 4. Uh, they're, they're in the wilderness. They've, they've left Egypt. They've not crossed the Red Sea yet. They haven't gotten that far. They haven't received the Ten Commandments. Uh, but they're on their way. And they're at to a place now where they don't have any water. And once again, they're complaining. We looked at that, uh, I think, last week. Where they just complain and complain and complain. And... Every time they complain, it just seems like the children of Israel want to turn around and go back. Or somebody wants to go back to Egypt. And uh, there's nothing but death. There's nothing but destruction. There's nothing but uh, our own destruction. De destroying our own lives by our own hand. Back in Egypt. Back in where we used to be. But here they are complaining again. And so Moses said in verse 4... He said, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And that in, is indicative of a person's life who they're trying to live for the Lord, but the devil makes it hard for them to do that. 
The devil makes it almost impossible to do that. And instead of laying the blame where the blame belongs, blame the, I mean, blame the devil. The devil is the one who is throwing stumbling blocks in your way to keep you from going to the promised land. It's not God. But for some reason, people blame God. We blame God for when things go bad. We blame God when things don't go good enough for us. We blame God for uh, the sorrow that we have, for uh, maybe losing people that we love. We blame God for those things when actually the blame belongs to the devil. You should be praising God, worshiping God. Do what Job did. And Job found it nearly impossible to do it. But he had enough in his heart to say, I'm not cursing God. Blessed be the Lord. So they're ready to stone Moses and Moses knows it. So verse 5, the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. That rod is, of course, is Christ, represents Christ. Uh, the rod represents chastening. The rod represents rebuke. The rod represents correction and instruction. And um, in verse 6, God, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock. The rock now is Christ. Christ who was smitten by men at Calvary. Golgotha. He was beaten. He was smitten. He was struck many times. He was scourged. So now the rock represents Christ who is now suffering on our behalf. The water represents the water of life of salvation that is flowing out of Christ. Our salvation comes from God. Your salvation does not come from this church. Your salvation does not come from my preaching. Your salvation this morning, Dave, and your family, and Kyle, is not, in that, is not waiting for you in that baptistry. Your salvation comes from the water of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. So you understand now why he has to smite the rock. It's a representation of Christ and his suffering on the cross. And he said, there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Verse 7. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Let me just do this. And let's be honest in the house of God. How many of you have ever said, Is the Lord with me or not? Raise your hand. I'm raising my hand. You know, the disciples, when Jesus was asleep in the boat, and that storm came, and they were trying to wake Jesus up, uh, Pastor Kelly preached one time, he said, this is the stupidest thing you'll find in the Bible. The disciples of Jesus, waking Jesus up and asking Him, saying, Carest thou not that we perish? The whole purpose of Jesus being on the earth is because he cared whether or not they perished. And so, that's why he called the place Massa and Meribah. Is the Lord among us or not? Now verse 8. <clears throat> and this is going to change stories here, but I wanted to lead up to it. In verse 8. Then came Amalek. And fought with Israel in Rephidim. Let's stop right now and go to prayer. You pray for me so that I can preach what God would have me to preach. The message would go His way. And we'll give God the glory. Father, I pray dear God that you would give me help from heaven this morning. Lord, I do not come here saying I deserve it. Because I don't. But I'm asking you, Father, for these that are hearing for their benefit, for their blessing, for their help. And Father, if I struggle through this message, let it be for their benefit, 
and your glory. So that, Father, when you win, you change somebody's life. And when you have reached down into the heart of some sinner and changed their life completely, and they yield themselves to you, Father, so that when these six this morning walk the walk of baptism and announce to the world and our church and those online as witnesses, announcing to the world we are going to follow Christ all the way until we die. Father, so that all the glory and all the praise goes to you, because that's where it belongs. <clears throat> Father, teach us what we need to know this morning. And help us, dear God, to be ever mindful of those who need our help. Especially those, Father, that we would never think that they needed anybody's help. Everybody needs help every now and then. So, Father, bless this message, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, I'm going to tell you who Amalek uh, represents. <clears throat> if I remember right, I did a little genealogy there. I think he's from, I think he's one of the Moabites. The word Amalek, Malek, is a Hebrew word that depicts like evil angels. Uh, Moloch, the god Moloch, Moloch is basically the same word as Malek. And they both uh, speak of like a chief among angels. And in this case, this would be evil ones. So basically, let's say that Amalek represents the devil. And as we are doing in this series, Amalek represents uh, maybe the addiction that you're fighting in your life. Or it rep Amalek represents... Um, a, a hindrance to where you want to be in Christ. If you are, if you're honest before God, you will never be satisfied with where you are because there is always a work to do in our lives. Let's just say amen to that. None of us are ever going to achieve this pinnacle of success in Christ and say, well, I'm, I've attained to it. Not even Paul admitted to attaining to it. He said, I, I haven't made it yet. Paul recognized, he tells us this basically in Romans chapter 7, that as long as this flesh body lives, he is going to struggle as a sinner in this world. But he knows that when he dies and sheds off this corruption, that God is going to raise him incorruptible, and he then will finally have achieved what he's longed for so long, what I long for. I long for perfection. I long for being sin free. I long for a, a, a life that, that does not hurt other people, that does not bruise people, that uh, is a blessing to the kingdom of God. I long for that and I know that I will never attain to it until the day I die. Then, by the grace of God, I will be in heaven with those who've gone before. So Amalek, let's say Amalek represents the devil who is fighting you in your life right now and you recognize that his work is against you and uh, you don't know how to fight him and so you need God in your life right now so then Amalek uh, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim now as I read this story some of you are going to recognize it and Moses said unto Joshua <clears throat> choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Now, I just remembered. I was wrong when I tell you it, it, he came from Moab. If I remember right now, I think he came from Esau, Edom. Uh, some of you may want to do a little digging on that and check it out for me. I hate to say something that's wrong and mislead somebody. So I try to be careful. But anyway, on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. What is Moses going to do with that rod? What good does that rod have to do with Moses sitting on top of a mountain 
and everybody else down there fighting. Wouldn't, wouldn't the Israelites be better served if Moses went down to the battlefield with them? No. Not in this, not in this instance, no. And we're going to find out. If you don't know this story, you're going to find it out. Verse 10, so Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, Aaron and Hur are going to play a very, very important role in this story. If you don't know this story, you need to understand that these two men actually are going to be about as important as Moses is, if not more so. Because Moses is about to find something out. Remember, Moses is the leader. Moses is the head. Moses is the chief. He is the one ruling over the people of Israel. He is the one ruling over their affairs. He is the one leading them. Moses, among the men of Israel, is the most important one there. But we're going to read something about Moses that may shock you. Verse 11, And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. In other words, the children of Israel are losing the battle. And let me run this by you just for a minute. The things that are worth keeping are always worth fighting for. I have a marriage that is worth keeping. That means it's worth fighting for. I have children that are precious to me. I want to keep them. They are worth me fighting for. Number one, I'm, I am not a violent person, but if you came and tried to attack one of my kids, I just might shoot you. Amen? Or my grandkids. I'll hand my grandkids over to God all day long. But nothing in this world better hurt them. Amen? See, they're precious to me. My faith is precious to me. And I don't want to get into the discouragement that happens in life that robs us of our faith and robs us of our joy. My faith is worth fighting for. My church is worth fighting for. You people here, you people online. I have fought battles unknown to you. For your benefit. I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, I'm not trying to elevate myself. I'm just here to tell you, that's what this place means to me. It's precious to me. And I don't want to thank you, Roy. And I don't want to be anywhere else. So, verse um, 12. Well, let me, verse 11. When Amalek prevails, it scares me. It does. It scares me that I could lose everything that is precious to me, that I love, that I want to keep. It scares me. And when it scares me, there's only one thing that I can do. And that is, call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. I used to have a, 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 a teacher, math teacher in at Festus uh, Junior High, Mr. Bradley. And Mr. Bradley was the teacher that if you had, uh, if you got detention after school, you had to go to Mr. Bradley's classroom and do your detention in there. Mr. Bradley had a deal going with anybody that could do it. He said, you either spend 30 minutes in here with me or 10 minutes holding two dictionaries out at arm's length. 
And he tried, he had us in one of our classes one day, we had a couple guys that were football players, and they said, you know what, let's try it. Mr. Bradley said, okay, come on over here. I think Harold Brown, one of them, he tried it. Some of these big guys, you know, and uh, he put two dictionaries in their hand, and within about three minutes, they're like, Go home and try it when nobody's looking without the dictionaries. You can't do it for more than four minutes. You can't do this. The weight of your own hands is too heavy for you to hold out like this for more than four or five minutes. Much less ten minutes. So basically he knew he had them for 30 minutes no matter what. Moses' hands were heavy. Now, don't you listen to this now. And what I'm about to say, I'm not, I'm not trying to exalt anybody. Moses is the leader. Moses is the head. Moses is the chief. The hands of those who are in authority are always going to be heavy hands. You understand what I'm saying? Those who are under authority do not have the burdens that those who are in authority carry. And I'm not trying to belittle anybody. I'm not trying to exalt anybody. God picks people to be the leader. And I can tell you being on this side is a lot more worrisome and a lot more burden being on your side of it. I have to deal with people's issues that I just not deal with. I've had to take people aside and show them their sin in some cases. And it was all over with. Cases, they denied it. And basically, following the scriptures, had to ask them to leave. That's not something I enjoy doing. But somebody's got to be in charge. Somebody's got to do what needs to be done for the welfare and the benefit of the body of this church. The body of my family. The body of this nation. Our politicians should be servant leaders, not corrupt rich men that are only there to take from us and not give for us. Amen! Moses is in charge and Moses' hands are heavy. So what I'm saying is, Moses can't do it by himself. Now, let's go back now to what we've been talking about. Addictions and issues of life. Nobody can do it by themselves. You know why we have church service? Because you can't live for Christ by yourself. And don't let, don't let people say, well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I just don't go to some corrupt church. How do you know they're corrupt? Well, you are right. The church is full of sinners. That's why they have church. Remember I said this. The church is the hospital for the sinner and not a resort for the righteous. Amen? And those of you who are here, you are admitting to the world that you are in fact a sinner. And that you have done things that are not just a little wrong. They're a lot wrong. And you don't want to die and go to hell. You want to go to heaven and you know that you cannot make it by yourself. Everybody, everybody needs help. Everybody does. In fact, turn to Genesis chapter 2. This came to me uh, this morning during the song service. Did I miss a verse in one of the songs? That's, yeah, I thought so. That's probably, that's probably what I was thinking about. I want you to look now, guys, 
I want you to look at this. In um, verse 18. Now God, on everything He's created, has said, God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. But in verse 13, in verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be, what? Alone. Do not think that your wife is a burden for you to bear. She is there to help you. Say amen. amen. And it's not good for you to be alone. Everybody needs help. Amen. And you husbands and you men, you all need God's grace, and God will deliver that through your wife. Sometimes even as she's lost, God will do it. I will make, look at this, I will make him a what? Help meet for him. And God gave me the exact woman that I needed throughout my life to help me in the areas that I struggle with. She's here to help me. She's not here to make my life miserable. Let's keep reading in Exodus. Uh, let's see here. Let me scoot down here. Okay, I want to show you. Let, let, let's go back to verse uh, 12. And I want to show you something. Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. Okay, that's verse 12, right? I don't have it up here. But anyway, so they put it under him because I'm sure his legs got tired too. Moses, have a seat. Because and Moses, Moses' responsibility here is not transferable. When Moses gets tired, he can't take this and give it to Joshua and say, Joshua, hold on to this. Hold it, hold it up in the air now. Oh, my arms are tired. God told Moses to do that. There's one man that, to do that, and that is Moses. Moses takes that, and he knows he can't give it to anybody else. And he's tired. And he knows that Amalek will win the battle. When his, not if his arms come down, but when they come down. He can't do it alone. He must have help. So they took a stone, sat, sat there on... And, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Amen. One couldn't do it, but when he got some help, they all did it together, and the whole army won the battle. Somebody say amen. amen. Woo! Now, let me show you something that God told me here a while back. I want you to get this picture. Moses sitting there. Okay, he's holding up the rod. And then we have Aaron on one side. Yeah, it's Aaron instead of Joshua. Have Aaron on one side and, and her. No, it is. No, it's Aaron. And, and her on the other. And I want you to understand what these two guys represent. Take your Bible. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22. Remember now, just because we're not under the curse of the law doesn't mean the law does not have any place in our life. If God said, thou shalt not steal, then you ought not steal. If God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, then you ought not commit adultery. You ought not adulterate marriage. If God said, thou shalt not bear false witness, then you ought not lie. If God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, then you shouldn't have any, anything that comes between you and God. But the law is heavy, is it not? The law is a burden that you and I cannot bear. We need help. So God made us a help. In Matthew 22, verse 36, they asked him, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Now that comes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is the first and great 
command it. Now, you may not be able to uh, get, get through life without lying or get through life without stealing something or get through life without at least thinking about adultery. But when you put your heart on God and you decide that you love God, well, I'm here to tell you that when you love God, it becomes a whole lot easier to do what's right. Say amen. Now, the second law, verse 39, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, God gave you people in your life. Gave you a family, gave you a wife, gave you a husband, gave you children, gave you grandchildren, cousins, aunts, uncles, it doesn't matter who it is. Grandmas, grandpas. God gave you, uh, listen to this now, how many grandparents are raising children, grandchildren right now in this country? It's everywhere. It is everywhere. You know why? The parents ran into issues that they could not bear alone, but they didn't seek help. The second commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, under the law, we may find it difficult to not steal, not lie, not at least, as I said, think about adultery, not covet. That's a thought crime. Coveting is the one commandment that your brain does. And try stopping your brain from sinning. And yet, when you decide that you love your wife, and you decide you love your children. And you decide you love your grandchildren. You'll find it a whole lot easier to not offend them by breaking the commandments. Does that make sense? So, then he said, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. So, one day it, it occurred to me that there was a picture of that in your Bible. Look at this. Let's say that... Uh, oh, let's see here. Let me get a pen here. So, let's say that here... Where is it? Here it is. Let's say that right here is Aaron. He represents the law... And he represents the one commandment, love the Lord with all your heart. Moses is the man who wants to love the Lord with all his heart. He wants to not have idols. He wants to uh, uh, not have any other gods before God. He wants to do what's right. But he finds that it's heavy and it's a burden that he can't bear. So he needs help. And so God sent someone the law to help him so that instead of just keeping commandments to keep commandments, he loves the Lord and he doesn't want to break any of the commandments. He wants to please God and honor God and love God back. And so Aaron says, Moses, I got this one. And then we have over here, we have her. H-U-R, not H-E-R. Her represents love thy neighbor. Boy, did I spell that wrong. Love thy neighbor. Sounds like I've changed pronouns, doesn't it? Oh my goodness. Love thy neighbor. You may have a problem. Listen. Every problem that we have in life will affect the people around us that we love the most. And instead of pushing them away, maybe they could just come over and say, do you need help? Yeah, I need help. I can't do this alone. So they take it and they hold it up. 
The Bible says about a threefold cord that's hard to be broken. One strand, you can probably break that, but you take three strands and bind them together, that's a threefold cord, you can't hardly break them. Two is better than one, three is better than two. In this case, you've got two helping you, willing to help you. And in life, hopefully God would give you a husband that would help you, a wife that would help you. Children, you would rely upon the help of good parents. And you would say, I need help. And they'll help. All of us, in one way or another, need help. So Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on one side and the one on the other. Now, turn to Galatians chapter 6. Yeah, Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, as you know, that's everybody in this church. Everybody in this church gets overtaken in a fault. Who in here does not have faults? That's what I thought. We all have them. And what our nature is, our nature is to hide it from everybody and just deal with it alone. But you will soon find out that that won't work. Again, this is why it is my goal to have a church here that, number one, sticks with the Word of God, but number two, does not forget that everybody is a sinner here. And in that sense, we're equal. Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4 all bear that out. That while you may sin in one area, you look down your nose at the others and say, well, I don't do that. So, you big dummy, you're a sinner. Just like they are. See, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Why? considering thyself the next time you're going to be the one that needs the help I've had my wife come to me and help me I've had my children come to me and dad I want to help you I've had my grandchildren cheeseburger come upstairs oh next thing I know he'll be up there Papa what you need cheese I just came up here to pray for you. I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm a rich man to have that. You see, if you don't help people, if you don't think that people... I, there are people in this world who honestly think this way. They think that anybody with a problem, well, it's their own fault. They deserve it that way. Well, of course, it's our fault. That doesn't mean we don't need help. And he says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So the same people that I seek to help with what I do, they seek to help me so that I can continue to do what I do. I can't do it alone. I'm learning that. I didn't say I learned it. I said I'm learning it. I can't do it alone. I need help. 
I'd like to say I'm not too proud to admit it, but that's not really true. So he says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I bear your burdens, you bear my burdens, we all bear one another's burdens, and all of us together will make sure that all of us together reach the promised land. Somebody say amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Amen. Turn to Matthew. He says the same thing. Jesus says the same thing. This is not just Paul out on a limb somewhere. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole point of anything is restoration. Come into honesty. Come in to ask help. Moreover, eight, Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. Be Who is it supposed to be between? You and them. That's it. The moment that you broadcast it to other people is the moment you decided you didn't want to help. You just wanted to be one up on somebody else. That person needs help. Maybe God can use you to be the one to help him. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy what? Brother. Brothers, I found out in a family, Alicia, we can offend one another and be mad at one another. And then be over it. Because we're family. And we get over it. And we just let it go. Because we're family. And when we are a family here in this place, there's always going to be somebody in this church that's going to do something you don't like. Or that you get a little offended at. Or you think they're stupid for doing it this way. But they're family. They're family. And while it may peeve you for a while, by the end of the day, you're over it. And it's all gone now. And now the devil cannot put a wedge between us anymore. Somebody say amen. I don't know how to end this. I think I'm done. I want to have a word of prayer. Uh, Dave, you and your family can go, Mad uh, Madison and, and Kyle, if you would. Meet me at the back. While they're getting up to leave, just everyone bow your head. And uh, I want you to... Um, Think about what I said. Think about what God is saying here. Ask yourself the question. Number one, am I Moses? Do I need help? That's a, that's a looking in the mirror moment. When we look in the mirror, we find things that we don't like and um, it's hard to take it really is because we don't we don't want to be this way but there's no getting around it we're this way so number one do you need help number two have you seen someone or know someone that needs help? Now, just so you understand, there is a sin in the Bible called being a busybody in other people's affairs. I'm not asking you 
for you to go around the whole church and and think that you can are have been ordained by God to fix everybody's problems. We've had people like that in this church. They don't go here anymore. And that one of them said to me, Pastor, I'm just having a problem. I said, what? what are you prob I just have a problem because I, I just, I'm finding it difficult to show people in this church what they're doing wrong in their life. And I asked the man, I said, who told you it was your job to do that in the first place? And um, we just did not get along. And they left. And they went to another church in town. I know, I know it for a fact. Because the pastor had to ask them to leave. They did it to the church that they went to. Some people just have that as a problem. A busy body looking for an opportunity to gloat over somebody under the guise of being a helper. You watch out for people like that. But you're here this morning... And you know that there's somebody that needs help. They don't need judgment. They've already got that. They don't need condemnation. They condemn themselves every day. And they know it. They need help. The first thing they need is prayer. And if God moves them... To come to you and say to you, I need help. Then help them. Help them with whatever you can. Help them with what's happened in your life and how God helped you. Paul said that when God comforts us, in our trials, then we are able then to comfort others with the comfort that we were comforted with. The reason why you fell into certain sins and God brought you out is because God is going to use you to help somebody else who has fallen into those sins and God's going to use you to help them. So think this morning of somebody that needs help and you pray for them.